On Christmas Eve in the late 1980s, John McLean, an off-duty New York City cop, dropped an Eastern European terrorist onto the hood of a sedan being piloted by LAPD officer Al Powell. Now, on May 3rd, 2021, an Atlanta Fed researcher dropped a blog post onto the hood of a sedan, a Brookings Institute sedan piloted by Ben Bernanke. Now, in the documentary that we all saw, 1988 documentary, we saw the self-satisfied McLean say, welcome to the party, pal. Is that what the Fed researcher said after he posted on the Atlanta website, Atlanta Fed website? We're going to ask Jeff Snyder, the head of global research, after I ask him if Die Hard is his favorite movie of all time. Is Die Hard my favorite movie of all time? No, but it is close to the top. <laughs> okay. Jeff. Who does not like Die Hard? I mean, it's, it's one of those Communists. classic movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the East German terrorists. That's right. Uh, Jeff, we're going to be talking about long-term interest rates. And when uh, academics talk about long-term interest rates, they don't look at them as a monolithic number. They look at them as a, as a number made up of parts, three parts. Tell us how the academic sees a long-term yield interest rate. They're decomposed into parts, as you said, uh, and it goes back to Irving Fisher in 1907, when he said, look, interest rates are, you know, the sum of inflation expectations and real uh, the expect changes in, in real interest rates. So changes in inflation expectations, as well as changes in real interest rates. We can, we can, we can parcel them up in different ways. And I like to think of it as more of um, inflation expectations and the expected future path of short-term rates, which is a proxy for real rates and things like that too. And, but academically, how do you do that? How do you, how do you take a bond yield, the treasury yield and chop it up into pieces and put it into a model and figure out what the mathematically is going on in, in something so vast as the bond market. And the way it's been done is they come up with statistical models, factor models, uh, affine models that say, well, we're going to we're going to program a bunch of numbers and a bunch of linear regressions of price factors. And we're going to come up with our own answers for what goes on and, and how can we break down a long term bond yield. And usually it's we have our, our proxy for short term interest rates and real rates. And then there's a remainder. We don't know what the remainder is. We just we come up with our proxy. We subtract it from the nominal yield, and there's there's a little bit left over. We'll call it a term premium, and we'll say, well, that must be the amount that, that the bond investor needs to be compensated for for holding a longer term instrument. That's what we'll call it. But in reality, it's nothing more than a mathematical remainder. We we model short term rate expectations, inflation expectations, and then we we have a little bit left over that we don't know what to do with. And that's that's how these term premiums come up with. That's how. Uh, econom econometrics dices up bond yields and bond rates. Uh, Daniel Want down in Australia is a uh, macroeconomist, chief investment officer of a uh, prerequisite capital. And uh, I remembered when I was reading this paper that a couple of years ago, he wrote a paper about long term yields and bonds and inflation. And I'm just going to read a quote here from him. It's in the section conventional academic theory regarding bond yields. Term premium is simply the reconciling item that makes an academic equation for bond yields work. Basically, term premium is short for, we have no idea what else drives yields. Academics, central bankers, and market practitioners theorize about what the term premium could really be measuring, but in the majority of cases, whenever you hear someone talking boldly about term premium, they are usually just trying to sound intelligent, but in reality, just communicating to you their confusion as to what is actually happening with yields. He's such a nice guy, but this is pure fire. And now we're going to be transitioning to Bernanke, who is talking who loves about to talk about term premiums <laughs> and only talk as I said, you know, I, we talk about the, the studies for quantitative easing and how they most of the time they say, well, it doesn't really lower interest rates. So what does it do? And a lot of these studies trying to save face and trying to say that QE does something. What they say is it lowers term premiums, which is exactly this, as, as, as you just said, it's exactly their way of saying we got nothing. We got to come up with something here to say QE is effective. Well, maybe it lowered term premiums. And really, 
what Ben Bernanke would say is, oh no, term premiums, they're not just a mathematical remainder, they're significant. They're an indication of risk. And so if QE lowers term premiums, it doesn't do anything else, but even if it lowers term premiums, that's the Fed helping out because it, see, it makes the market see lower risk ahead, which is total garbage. It really is garbage. And he's absolutely right to point out that anybody that points to term premiums as any kind of significant analysis is total bunk. And it's an indication that they don't know what they're talking about. As we've said many, many times before, going back to Alan Greenspan's conundrum, who thinks that long-term bond yields are a series of one-year forwards, it's absolutely clear economists don't understand rates and bonds which again that's that's one of those things that sounds so ridiculous it can't i mean it can't possibly be true right central bankers don't know anything about interest rates isn't that all they do but it's absolutely true and when they bring up term premiums they're basically opening their mouth and removing all doubt that they're fools jeff i don't know if it was in this article and the one we're talking about is called global not term premiums what low yields really say may 4th 2021 Alhambra Investments. I don't know if it was in this article, but you had a great line this week where you wrote, uh, economists don't know anything about bonds, but they know enough to want to change the subject. It was some, I'm paraphrasing, but that was, that was great. Okay, let me read a little bit here from Bernanke, just so that we understand where the Atlanta Fed researcher is coming from. So this is in 2015, Bernanke. What about the decline in long-term yields since early 2014? Asks Bernanke. In the US at least, that decline is somewhat surprising as economic fundamentals have recently seemed more consistent with rising, not falling long-term yields. By the process of elimination, with fundamentals stable or improving, much of the decline in yields over the past year must reflect a sharp drop in term premiums, 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, economic fundamentals were not improving. No, and they were. It, that was most evident and most clear. You can under, you can sympathize a little bit with what Bernanke was saying. He said, you know, the U.S. doesn't look too bad. The fundamentals here are okay, mm. but it was really it was getting bad elsewhere. And so I think what Bernanke said in other, you know, this was a four part blog post. They thought he said, well, yeah. It seems like it's getting dark in Europe and, and some of the emerging markets are having real struggles, but what does the hell does that have to do with the US? Because it's so closed. So his point was, you know, almost clean as dirty shirt slogan that US Treasury bond yields should not be, re if they are going lower, which they were, he reasoned that, well, that can't be economic fundamentals, therefore it must be this remainder. That's why he says process of elimination, it must be term premium. Because his view was the economic fundamentals applied only to the United States. Atlanta Fed, May 3rd, 2021. Is there a global factor in U.S. bond yields? By Nikolai, oh man, who printed this? It's so small. Nikolai Gospodinov. This is him dangling the, the Eastern European terrorists out the window. And here he is. He's about to drop it on the sedan from the Brookings Institute. Quote, but because the term premia are obtained as a residual component in the model, any misspecification of the factor structure that drives equilibrium interest rates by omitting a common global factor, for example, may result in erroneously attributing some fundamental movements to the term premia. The body is mangled on the hood of the car, yeah. Jeff. What does that mean? He's basically saying you got it all wrong, Ben. <laughs> you were completely wrong. No, and what the, the point of the article was that we, you should not and could, you really could not have ignored the fact that U.S. rates were moving in concert with global rates. And there's a synchronicity across global bond markets that defies and belies the idea that these are all just closed systems that are sparsely connected. What he was saying is, that, look, there's there's common global factors here. And so Ben Bernanke's analysis that the U.S. economy was improving might have been technically true, but also irrelevant because the entire global economy was not improving. And that could explain why U.S. Treasury yields were falling. But if you don't understand that, if you if you if your factor models are not factoring this global economic situation into them, when you do your, your calculations and you add up that remainder of shrinking term premiums, you're attributing to term premiums, which is you know useless information, even more useless information. Hmm. You're giving you're giving yourself false meaning from a useless calculation. That's what he's saying is, look, 
If you think that term premiums are shrinking because you omit this global factor, then you don't understand why interest rates are falling to begin with. And that's really the, you know, the idea here is that, okay, we have a global system. What makes it a global system? That's the next step in all this. Now that we understand what interest rates are possibly telling us, that maybe U.S. rates are low, and it doesn't necessarily mean the U.S. economy is bad at that particular moment in time. Maybe it tells us something more important, more fundamental about the entire global economic situation, which includes maybe the U.S. being the cleanest, dirty shirt. All right, I'm going to read another part, and I want the audience to hear, welcome to the party, pal. Here it is, quote, from the researcher again. This observation raises the possibility that domestic bond yields, including those in the U.S. Treasury market, may be anchored by global economic developments, provision of global liquidity, and international markets arbitrage. A global economic system, just like how you were saying, euro dollar system. The U.S. is not a locked uh, model, a global economy separate from the rest of the world. Yeah, it's not a closed system. I mean, what are the implications of that, though? Well, what it could be is, it, it, specifically to 2015 and 2016, it was that, okay, the U.S. is stable and appropriate. It's not that bad. And yes, it's bad outside, but that's the point. If it's bad outside, it's not going to be good in the United States for very long because right. this is a synchronized system. And that's actually what happened. My people, my, many people probably don't even realize that how close we came to a recession, especially in late 2015. The U.S. was on the verge of a recession in 2015. It was not booming. In fact, the Federal Reserve admitted as much because they did that ridiculous rate hike, the first one in December 2015, and then took an entire year, the entire next year off until December 2016. Oh, is that right? I thought it was in 2014, then 2015. Well, the first rate, they, they ended quantitative easing in December, in December of 2014, expecting that the first rate hike would follow in about six months June, because yeah. it was a continuous policy of... of yeah. of, of uh, removing easy accommodation. And then instead, they had to wait till December of 2015. And then once they did the first rate hike in December of 2015, it sat there for an entire year as the loneliest rate hike in history. Yeah. <laughs> because the U.S. situation did not improve. It actually did the opposite. The U.S. economy became more like the rest of the global system, which is exactly what interest rates in the U.S. and outside the U.S. were trying to tell Ben Bernanke if he didn't have his term premiums to fall back on. So once you realize what's going on here, this term premium argument is nothing more than gobbledygook, and it's missing, in fact, this global factor, these models are all wrong, and therefore their calculations are gonna be all wrong, therefore the justifications are gonna be completely meaningless, which is exactly what we're seeing. And that's the parallel to today, right? The US economy, according to Warren Buffett, is red hot, but yet, what are treasury yields? What are interest rates around the world doing? They're not rising. So maybe no. the U.S. economy is red hot. Let's assume that it is. What the bond market is saying is, okay, this one part of the global economy is doing pretty well, but what about all the rest of it? Not doing well, not doing red hot, not doing inflationary. And furthermore, our lesson from Ben Bernanke is that even if the economy of the U.S. is doing well, balance of probabilities over time, it's going to look more like the rest of the economy than vice versa. Yeah, the quote that we read from Bernanke in 2025, the beginning, the part that you bolded was, by the process of elimination, therefore term premiums. And I just had to, I went to the uh, Britannica and I pulled up the Aristotle model of the universe and I was trying to figure out how did they explain the, the the different planets how they didn't quite fit into aristotle's model and it just sounds so similar aristotle's model of the universe had trouble explaining some planetary phenomena so the most important solution to this problem was proposed by claudius ptolemy in the third century he argued that planets move on two sets of circles yeah. a deferent and an epicycle this explained the retrograde motion while keeping the planets in their circular orbits around Earth. Where this did not fit, Ptolemy proposed an eccentric. An eccentric orbit had a center different from the Earth and accounted well for the changes in the planet's brightness. Ptolemy's last device was an equant. 
Eventually, the Ptolemaic system held ground for centuries until too many discrepancies cried for new solutions. And Jeff, that's how you end your article. You start listing all the discrepancies that have recently been ticked off, the global savings glut, that QE starves liquidity, that bond yields are only lowered by 50 basis points by QE, portfolio effects in Japan. And now this, here's another one, this researcher. Yeah, and it's, it's I'm a lot you know, very much like Aristotle and Ptolemaic astronomy that, you know, there are these, they become too big to ignore, right? These discrepancies, these differences, these divergent, whatever you want to call them. Term premiums is a perfect example. It's a, it's a, you, it's such a clear way of, of trying to make sense of what you're just wrong about. We've got this wrong, but how do we not be wrong? And it's, it's, it's the exact opposite of enlightenment scientific approach, which is look, we base our theories on evidence, and when the evidence falsifies our theories, we change the theory to fit, to match the evidence, not the other way around. We don't try to match the evidence to tr to fit a theory because we we love the theory we came up with it, and or we're the we're the father of my, of American QE, which is really what I think motivates Bernanke most of all. I think he realized that these discrepancies are damning, and like like Jay Powell and his treasury bill policy over the last 14 months, they know that they've got a lot of this wrong, but they're not ready to come clean on it. And so let's talk about term premiums and discuss about how ridiculous they are. You know, I just can't understand why there's nowhere in that model. There's nothing about collateral, nothing about collateral as to what, how treasuries are valued. So I was thinking, all right, well, what does Daniel say? about uh, how treasuries are really valued. What, are they, what kind of information do they really convey? And he says at the cyclical level, bond yields are driven by the following combination of drivers, inflation versus deflation expectations, sovereign credit risk premium, economic confidence versus the demand for collateral. Yes, thank you. And capital inflows versus outflows. That I makes would add sense. To that, I would add to that to the the Atlanta Fed's researchers' conclusions is that's part of the global factor. The global factor isn't just economic fundamentals; it's demand for collateral across the entire monetary system, which spans out a lot of it outside of the United States. So that's another global factor, a liquidity factor, a monetary factor that's directly incorporated into this 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 idea that this is not a closed system. This, the U.S. fundamentals are not the only driver of of underlying decompositions in U.S. Treasury yields. There's, there's a global factor, a global monetary, global economic factor that's far, far more meaningful. And if you don't factor it, then you're not doing a correct process of elimination because you, you don't even know what you haven't eliminated. Great show, Jeff. I will talk to you next week. Okay, Emil, take care.